so quick show of hands, how many of you uh, did not see, either attend or see online the part one of this talk? A fair number. Okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, sorry for the rest of you because there will be a little bit of repetition, but hopefully there will be some new stuff for you as well. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to talk about is a couple of different things. I'm going to talk about duplication of code. I'm also going to talk about the dry principle. Now, how many of you have heard of the dry principle? Oh, pretty much all of you, right? And how many of you think that the dry principle says, don't repeat yourself? A fair number, right? Okay, here's the thing. That's not what it says. What it says is this. It says every piece, I actually have to read it. So every piece of knowledge, that's important, piece of knowledge, must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. So this is, uh, this is not just about duplicated code, which is a code smell, which is a different thing from a principle, but we're gonna talk about the dry principle for a minute. So, in an interview that Dave Thomas, who was one of the, it was Andy Hunt and Dave Thomas, the pragmatic programmer, uh, they, they introduced this idea of the dry principle. And Dave said this, most, take, most people take dry to mean you shouldn't duplicate code. That's not its intention. The idea behind dry is far grander than that. He said grander, not greater, I love that. Um, and then uh, a systems knowledge is far broader than just its code. It refers to database schemas, test plans, the build system, and even documentation. So this is a lot different from cutting a couple of characters. Uh, so this inspired uh, the development of Active Record, the part about database schemas specifically. So how many of you were using Rails when it was like zero point whatever? A few, right? So you remember having to, to write out your own uh, SQL statements in order to, to, to put the schema together instead of, we didn't have migrations yet back then. So we had attributes defined in SQL, and the idea was that like all the tools that we were using in Java and C Sharp before that, like Hibernate, you had to define these things in both places. And so here, we could define the, the attributes in SQL in one place, and then you didn't have to declare them inside of the model, but you could still refer to them from the outside. Um, and so, the next step though is that we, we also add methods into the model, right? So here we have a full name method and it uses the first and last name. Uh, and so, remember that dry says uh, a single representation. Every piece of knowledge must have a single representation. So if I want to ask the question, what kind of names does a person have? I have to look in two different places here. So right away we're not dry. Uh, and this is what you get if you ask it like an IRB. Say, hey, what are your public instance methods that match name? And we get, we get the full name. We don't get the first or last name because those are not instance methods yet. They will be later the first time you call them. Um, so, and then we get a bunch of internals of uh, active record and internals of Ruby, like instance variable names. So uh, this is what you have to actually ask in order to know, in order to get first name, last name, and full name. Um, you take all the public instance, instance methods, you add the column names. Uh, I map them to sim because I wanted them all to look the same. And then you have to take away all of the public instance methods. So uh, associations, we have to define in two places. We have to define uh, belongs to group here. I'm not pointing at my little screen, thinking, uh, here, and then up here, group ID, right? And we have to do that in both places. Um, all right, unambiguous. So uh, take a second and read that sign, because I love it. And there's not too many pictures in this. So. Uh, if you like the sign, here's the URL. I'll have the slides up later. You can go by. Uh, so <laughs> ironically, I, I wasn't clear on what unambiguous actually meant, so I looked it up. <laughs> this is this is the uh, this is the definition that I got. It said not ambiguous. So I went to ambiguous to figure out what unambiguous is not. Um, there's a lot going on here. It's, 
not exactly clear or unambiguous what it means. But in any case, let's, uh, let's look at this. So validations. Um, so you're not allowed to have nulls in the first or last name. And we have to define them. We don't have to define them, actually, in both places. We can define them in either, right? So which one is the one that we're supposed to do, and which one actually matters, right? So that's a little bit unclear. Um, it's got to be authoritative. So again, talking about validations, uh, here we put in that we're, we've got a bar chart 255, but then we can validate the length of having a maximum of 50. So which one wins? Which one's authoritative? So we don't know. Um, so it's not trial, right? Now, a uh, little later, there was, there was a lot of excitement around the fact that we had uh, migrations added because migrations let us write everything in Ruby, right? But that didn't solve the problem at all, right? Because we're still defining them in two different places. It's just in a language that we're familiar with, so we don't have to jump languages, but they're in two different places at all, so it's still not trial. Now, uh, data mapper. A uh, disclaimer, I've never used Data Mapper on a real project. I've only toyed around with it and, and, and I haven't had an opportunity to use it on a real project. Uh, so I'm not advocating that it's a superior tool. This is just in the context of Drive. That said, the way Data Mapper works is you define attributes, validations, associations, and methods all in the model, all in one place. Right? And from these declarations, you get uh, the schema. And there is a process for migrations, and, and I'm sure if any of you, do any of you have experience with data mapper? Some of you. So uh, I'd actually be curious to hear about the pitfalls of all this, because I imagine that it starts to get complicated when migrations get complicated. But nevertheless, um, uh, here we, it's single, it's authoritative, it's unambiguous, so that's more job. Now, don't panic, this doesn't mean that you have to hate Active Record. Um, Active Record gives you a lot of different benefits. Uh, and you know, there's all the integration points in Rails. If you're writing Rails app, Rails apps, it's an obvious fault to, to, to have. But um, you can't love it because it's dry in this particular context. So uh, since I'm knocking on Active Record, I guess I have to knock on our spec too. It's only fair. Um, little point of housekeeping. Uh, I have a love-hate relationship with, uh, with, with RSpec, so let's just get this out. Like, how many of you just hate RSpec? Two. I hate it too. <laughs> so we're all together. OK, how many? Wow, this is unfair. But how many of you love RSpec? OK, there's a bunch of abstainers, but I love it too. Uh, <laughs> so. Anyway, one of the one of the early inspirations uh, in our spec was this this idea too of dry that we want to uh, generate things from the test plans, right? So our spec we have executable documentation with some definition of documentation, right? So here uh, is, an, is an R spec example. This is using this new expect syntax that's coming up, and I'm going to be talking about that right now, but we can fight over it later. Um, so if you run this with a certain formatter, you get this uh, spit out at the bottom. This is sort of like a little summary. So the summary gets generated from the code. right? So in that respect, it's dry. Um, our spec specs itself. We're eating our own dog food. Um, so, and that's good. But somewhere along the line, there was a, the our spec story runner. Uh, which was uh, sort of a rewrite and introduction to the RSpec world of RBehave, which was based on JBehave, which was the first BDD framework. Uh, and then now everybody knows it as Cucumber because it got extracted out from RSpec and, and made into a separate project. So we also have Cucumber that we use to specify RSpec. So we've got executable documentation in Cucumber and in RSpec. And we also have a bunch of R guy. So this is not to say that when I say this, R spec itself is not dry. But the way we've even gone about using it within the project to, for executable documentation is not dry. So don't panic. You can still love R spec. You can still hate it, the few of you who 
said that. I hope you don't hate me too. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about duplicated code, which is just the principle, uh, the, the code smell, that there are similar code constructs in different parts of the same code base. It's very different, or maybe you can think of it as a subset. Uh, so we've got the duplicated code smell. We've also got people, well-known people like Uncle Bob Martin, saying things like duplicated code is the root of all evil in software. Um, so this is what I said sort of in, in context of, of, of the talk that I did. Uh, reducing duplication is really important, but every time you reduce duplication, you also increase coupling by introducing new dependencies. Right? And so it's important to depend on the right things. It's not that coupling is bad, it's necessary. We have to couple things together in order for them to work together in some way. But you want to be careful about how you couple things together. So as you're reducing duplication, that's very important to think about. So speaking of Uncle Bob, this is an example uh, from an article that he wrote. The, uh, the link to it's right here. And again, I'll put these slides up later. Um, and what he was talking about was that he was going through a code base for a project he has called Slim, and he found these two methods in two different parts of the system that were like 100% identical, exactly the same code as if they had different names. And so the problem was, the dilemma was, well, these methods actually do two different things conceptually. Even though the way they're implemented has the same result, one is converting something uh, into a Ruby method, and one is, is converting something into a file name. It just so happens that in this system, file names look like the Ruby method names. Um, so, but even though they mean different things, you know, we still want to get rid of the duplication. So one approach that he doesn't recommend in here, and, and, but it's something that I've seen a lot just in my experience working with other developers um, would be something like this. We've already got one implementation, so let's just delegate from the other one to that one. Um, now there's a problem with this, which is that what we're doing is, so the, the service on the left there is now dependent on the service on the right. Right, I just want to make sure I have it. Okay, so, Dependencies are transient, right? So what this means is that this client now depends on that service, which means that when that service has to make changes in order to benefit this client, they're going to have an impact on this client over here. Right? So you're going to run into some unexpected things showing up in other parts of the system when you make changes there. Theoretically. Um, I've seen it happen. It doesn't always happen. So a better approach here, which is what he recommends in, the, in this article, is to extract that out, use the extract method for factoring, uh, have a method that describes actually what this implementation is doing. It's taking something that's camel case and it's converting it to underscore. And then delegate out from the two methods to that statement. Now, there's a lot of really good things about this. First of all, the dependencies are all good. Uh, we're not depending on things like going across the boundary between those two different services. Uh, the, the other thing is that this is actually very uh, intention revealing, like within each of these methods now. And we have a more intention revealing name for what this code does. Because when you first look at it, you got to think about it for a minute. But now it's got a good name, and you don't have to think about it as much. Here, the rule about converting panel paste to a file name is you convert it to underscore. Same with the, the method name. Um, so when you're extracting a method, we usually do it for reuse, but that's just like the first step. When you, when you extract a method, you're introducing a new method, right? So you've got a new concept. You've just changed the design. Like, um, refactoring is changing the design without changing the behavior. Uh, and we could talk for an hour just about that because there's a lot of debate about you should be able to refactor without changing your tests, and that's true in, in some subset of the world, but not whole. So anyway. Uh, the previous talk has me thinking about all these testing things, so forgive me if I uh, 
digress for a second. So here's the thing. When you put a public method on an object, somebody's going to use it sooner or later because they're going to see it. It's going to provide them the service that they're So it's important that they have meaningful names that are not just meaningful like right now because you just extracted that and solved your immediate problem. But like the, the name where it very explicitly said, we're converting panel case to underscore, that's like a useful name. It tells you exactly what it does for you. Um, it should also make sense in the context of the object that it's in, because someone is going to have to go look at that code later and go, what is this thing? If, if, if it doesn't make sense both in the local context and in the broader context, then you're losing some value. So another refactoring that we might do to reduce duplication is to extract a superclass. So um, in, in our spec expectations, uh, we have a bunch of built-in metrics. And here's a couple. Uh, the code probably actually did look like this at one point, but it, it, it's pretty fluid in it. Um, but so in this case, we've got some very clear duplication. And, and keep in mind, there's like 10 or 15 of these, and they all are kind of similar. So how can we reduce this duplication in the same way? Um, so the first thing you want to do, or one common thing to do, I, sh I should say I'm giving examples here. This is not like, hey, this is what you should do. I just want to sort of wrap some uh, way to look at these things and, and evaluate them in the same way. Um, and then we do this pull-up constructor, uh, refactoring. So now we've got this base matcher class over here, and it's got the initialize method there. We still have the two very similar looking matches methods. So what do we do about that? So one thing you can do is to pull up that method, right? So we've got matches now. And so what matches does is the first half of what the, the other two matches methods does, which is it assigns it to the instance variable. And then the subclasses can do the thing that's specific to its type, which sounds like really good OO, except there's a couple of weird things about this. So first of all, we're, we're still calling super in both of these cases. And so there's still a little bit of duplication in terms of what each of the match, matches methods do in each class. They all have to call it to super. Um, that's not the worst offense, uh, but it can be weird when what super does changes, right? So the other thing is within this context here, just this subclass, we've got this uh, expected instance variable. And now, now granted, we're talking about a system where we get actual and expected and we compare them in like all of these different metrics. So having broad knowledge of the system might make sense, except that it turns out like there's this be within matcher, where the thing that's expected is uh, uh, there's a delta around it. And so the thing that gets passed to be within is the delta. It's not, so the initializer for that is, is the delta, not the expected. So actually, we ended up needing something different in that one particular matcher. All right. So here's a slightly better way. Um, you could give that super a meaningful name, right? Because before it just said super, and that doesn't really tell you what it's doing, right? So now instead, we, we, we put in, oh, I didn't put the method there, but just imagine it like right here, if you will. Um, it, it, it looks like, it looks like matches, um, just with a different name. So you could do that, and that's okay, but we still have the duplication, right? It's more attention revealing, but we still have the duplication. So in this particular case, this is, for me, a, a, a nicer solution, which is to introduce a template method. This is another effect. And for those unfamiliar, the idea is that the superclass def defines the procedure, and the subclasses define the implementation of the steps. Right? So here, the procedure of matches, and uh, well, I'll come back to this in a second, but is to assign actual to the instance variable, and then to call out to the subclass to to uh, do the evaluation. Now in the subclass, we get, uh, we get to write a, a function here, right? It, it takes in some data, it only operates on that data, there's no side effects. I don't have to worry about any magic instance variables. There's no reference to, to state that's managed elsewhere, so I don't have to 
be concerned with whether the base class does something different with expected in this case. Um, the other thing I was going to say is probably, and I don't have this on the slide, but probably what I would do is I would still write a method up here that says uh, assign actual, and that might seem like a little over, bit of overkill, because it's pretty obvious what it's doing, but there's this other concept that within any scope, every, all the code within that scope should operate at the same level of abstraction. So here we're calling out to a method, and this would be sort of easier to read this, even this little bit, if it said first do this, go assign the thing, and it had a name, and then do this, evaluate the match. Um, that's really subjective at this level, but when you get methods that are a little bit longer, that have more steps in the procedure, it can make a real big difference in your ability to quickly scan a method and understand what it's all about. Um, so in general, if you're pushing stuff up, if you're pulling up or pushing down, these are just the names they use in the refactoring book. I don't know why you can't push down and pull up, but this is just what the, the, the names are. So make sure the local view makes sense. Like whatever scope you're looking in, you can kind of understand uh, what's going on there without having to understand that, oh, this thing it, it comes from this other place that needs something. Uh, and sort of related, avoid using the state from the super class. Um, so, I'm going to just pull something out from the previous talk. I was going to put this on, on these slides, and I guess I eventually will, but I came up short for time and I couldn't get them formatted right, so I'm just going to use the old slides. Um, so I was working on this project, and in this project, uh, we had some routes, or routes, depending on what part of the country you're from. Um, and they looked like this. There were about 15 of them. And you take a look at that, and there's like a lot of duplication in these strings, right? And so uh, the guy that I was working with actually wanted to reduce the duplication. I'm going to take a little bit farther than he did, but let's just see what happens. So the first thing we notice is that uh, allocations, they all start with allocations. Um, so we'll start by doing that. We'll name the, oh, we should have named the, the, the what do you guys say, roots or routes? How do you say that? <laughs> Routes. <laughs> okay. I can't say it that well. All right. But routes is the closest. I'll go with that one. Okay. So anyway, we give them names and we, we, we substitute in uh, the, the constant. And then the next thing you notice is that they all start with source type. So we can pull that out also. We can do the same thing with source ID, target type. And so now, Every single string is just expressed once. And then everything here is from the constants. But actually, I mean, if you look, like source type and source ID, they both start with source, right? <laughs> target type and target ID, right? Same deal. And then in every one of these, you've got these curly braces and splashes. So let's stick those into an array. <laughs> And so somewhere down here we have our routes. And you know, you know what? Here's the most awesome thing about this. Imagine that we decided we wanted to go from, from camel case to snake case. ID and type, those are the only things we need to change. So now imagine that, that you're working on this app and a problem comes in. And someone says, hey, I went to this URL and something broke. And I've got to look at that, and I've got to find out in this mess what that means. Right? So it's not that helpful. Now compare that to this. Oh, that awful duplication. Right? So, so there are cases when cry makes sense, when reducing duplication makes sense. This is not one of them. Actually, each one of these is a concept by itself. It's a piece of knowledge. Right? And these are their single authoritative unambiguous definitions. So, there you go. Uh, so, the takeaway from that is dry doesn't mean don't type the same characters uh, twice, and we're talking about duplicated concepts not, and isolation of change, not duplicated characters. All right, so. 
part two, section three. Um, writing a slide one. So, yeah, that was that was my in case I slipped past it and forgot to go to the other presentation. That's a little cute. So uh, I know I, I missed Matt's talk about uh, hexagonal, hexagonal. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Um, so anyway, there's a library out there called Objectify. I'm not going to talk about Objectify, but basically it's aiming to solve a similar problem of how do we how do we come up with new abstractions in Rails that are different from the Rails framework uh, to make life easier. But the reason I brought it up is because um, here's some code that was in there. And you can see in this code, there's all these lines that kind of look the same. And somebody put in a, a pull request uh, to, to dry it up. And this is what the pull request looked like. Um, it actually goes to about over here. Uh, so, I don't want to do that. Not that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so sorry. Um, so here, let me reformat that so you can all see it. Um, and then I'll reformat it again so you can see it in the back. So here, here's the problem. The problem is it's like ridiculous to read. Like you can't look at this right away and go, hey, what's going on here? Um, we've got an extra level of nesting. So what, it's, what we're doing is we're going through all these, all those names. Let's go back here. This is the original. So the, the arguments to add are some key and some value. Right? So what we're doing here is we're turning that into a hash. So controller points to the value itself. And then we're iterating through that. And then for each key value, we're calling that one method. So we're like putting it all in a hash and taking it right back out. Um, and another thing that happens with this is you end up with these sort of arbitrary groupings of things. Like, so each line looks like there's some intent behind the fact that those two things are on the same line together. Uh, the other thing is, I mean, I don't know how <laughs> any been people, a few, right? Uh, so let's say you want to move any of these around, right? It's a lot easier to do. You want to add a new one in there, in, in, in any of them, right? And I, I'm thinking of them because there are some commands that are really targeted at that. But, um, so anyway, uh, we're talking about, Dry talks about pieces of knowledge, not use of knowledge. So when you have calls out to different methods, that's not the same as duplicating a concept somewhere. We're using the stuff in the system. That's what we're supposed to do. Um, so, dry abuse in specs. So, I saw this uh, this question on Stack Overflow, um, and I, I should point out, by the way, the pull request. I actually commented on that pull request, and the guy who submitted it was was in was very nice about it, in full agreement, and withdrew that part of the pull request. And there was a bunch of other really good stuff in it too. <coughs> we all agreed that that was just going too far in the name of Drive. So in this case, um, this question was, there's something that doesn't work. Uh, specifically, the, the unpublished item should redirect to error, wasn't working properly. Uh, why doesn't it work is the question. So the technical problem is this. The way, the, the way nested example groups work in our spec is that the four books in the outermost group runs before the ones in the innermost group. And as you go down the next thing, they run in that order. Uh, for this to work, this one, where it updates published to be false, needs to happen before the, where's the get? Oh, here it is, before the get, right? And our script won't let you do that. So that's the technical problem. Here's the real problem. Like, I was trying to make it too dry. It was like focused on I want to dry this up as much as possible at the expense of all readability and clarity and simplicity. So uh, stepping back, like 
I mean, uh, I don't agree with a lot of things that DHA says about testing. Uh, however, when he made his statement about a year ago about being sad about cucumber and RSpec and how much it gets used, um, he cited an example that looked a lot like this. And I have to say, I have some sympathy for that, uh, for that sadness. Um, so let's start with the way it would start out if you were actually doing this, like, you know, writing stuff out, finding the implication, and then removing it. Um, let's check on the time. Oh, good. Um, so this is probably what it would look like to start with. Now here's the thing. There's very, there's actually very little that's duplication in here. Um, we've got the redirect targets, right? There, it says redirect the success URL, and then here it should redirect the success URL. So that's one thing that that RSpec actually helps you get rid of by using the matchers to, to print out the names. Um, so you can still look at this. This tells you the intent, and then when you uh, when you run this in the the documentation format, it'll spit out the string that was there before. Um, so we still have get show duplicated, right, in both of them. And I mean, you could do this, right? You could pull it out to a method and then delegate out to it. Um, I don't. In this particular case, there's not that much value added to that. Uh, but in other cases, if you have long lists of, of arguments, it might be useful. But the thing, the thing is. <laughs> when you start doing things that are like part of the example, right? The idea of an example is, hey, here's a world. It's we know what's in this world. Let's do something and say what should happen, right? So when you start putting different parts of it in different places, you have to flip up and down the the, the stack, the 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 hierarchy of the example groups. It gets very confusing and difficult to understand uh, when when failures happen. This is quite simple. And so for me, I'd much rather just write this. And another thing about, in terms of dry and duplication, so the real problem that dry is trying to address is not, oh, my fingers hurt, I have to type this twice, right? It's that something happens over here, something just like it happens over here, we decide to change this one, and nobody remembers that we have to change this one, right? And then you end up with unexpected bugs. Um, stuff like this, this is all in the same file. We all, knew how to, we all know how to do searches in the places in the same file. Maybe even in a whole set of files. So, um, all right, and the other thing is like later, uh, maybe the, the declaration of the item, you, maybe you pull that out when you have multiple examples. Oh, one thing I was pointing out about this, by the way, is that I forgot to point out. Notice that in the first one, publish true, and in the second one, publish false. So even though the structures are the same, the intent of what they're describing is actually different. And so here we could say, okay, so we're in the published item context, we can, we can declare that once, uh, and then that's actually pretty much okay. Um, so for me, these are the guidelines that I go by, uh, your mileage may vary, but for me, givens can go either in a before hook or in the example directly, because a given, and this is interesting, uh, a lot of people talk about givens as being preconditions, and preconditions and like asserting on the, the preconditioned state is a very different idea than, than what a given is to me, uh, and anyone who wants to talk about it over, uh, is there any scotch on the boat? Over a scotch on the boat? I would, I would be happy to if I don't fall dead before then. Um, so it's been, it's been a uh, long day and I'm a little bit asleep. Um, so the whens and the thens, right, the event, the thing that you're saying, when this happens, then this should happen, they should always be inside the example. Um, and in terms of, now I want, I want to be clear about something, because there's a framework written by a guy that we all love here, called RSpec Given, the guy's name is Jim Meyer, and he's going to be talking about rate later. And I believe that the implementation of RSpec Given is that the thens are actually expressed in after books. Is that correct, Jim? Uh, say it again. The thens are? 
The, are the dens implemented in Africa? Uh, the dens are, um, no, they're before us. They're before us? Okay, I had it wrong. Excuse, I'm sorry, dens are hit blocks. Oh, okay, yay. <laughs> um, so, but, oh, I've got 10 minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm getting pretty close to the end. Um, so maybe we'll have some issues with your questions. So, the other thing I want to talk about is test helpers and band aids for design issues. So, uh, so here is some duplicated setup between uh, a couple of examples of a person. So we've got a person, and you set it up with names, but then the phone numbers you have to set explicitly. Um, and so maybe we're writing a bunch of these examples, and someone says, wow, that's such a pain in the ass to have to like, put it explicitly in there. I want to make a, a factory method that will just do that for me. So you write something like this, right? Create person, you give it the attributes. And so now that takes care of the same thing. Um, and here we get to say home phone, and this guy, uh, yeah, that's right, attributes home, uh, home phone up here gets assigned to phone numbers home. Um, so here's the problem. Let's say that I'm in IRB and I'm trying to explore some things and I want to set up a person. And I go to create a person using this. Well, I can't because it's a test helper and it's in it's under my spec directory or my test directory. Um, and then let's say that I want to use it for some other production code. And I can't for the same reason, right? So what, what we did by extracting this factory method is we covered up a little bit of a design problem. And I'm using an extraordinarily simple, oversimplified example here, but I think it gets the point across. Um, so what, what we probably want to do is something like this. Basically, embed all that inside. I did it this way with method missing, because like Francis, I think, said before, the first time I saw method missing, like the moment that fell in love with Ruby, um, I'm still, I still like it, in spite of what you all think. Um, so, but another thing might be, you know, if we, uh, if we have, if we have like a constraint set, we could define methods explicitly, like home phone method, and that would be perfectly fine too. But and and the important thing of that is we could change this all day how it's implemented, right? The way the way everybody talks to it is by creating a person and using these this hash value. Um, all right, that's all I got. So, are there any questions? What's What's the most beautiful code base I've ever seen? Uh, and it's the FIT code base written by Ward Cunningham. Um, that's my instinct without giving it too much thought. That was a knee-jerk reaction. Um, because it expresses a lot in a very little bit of code and it does it in clear ways. Um, I haven't looked at it in about six, seven years. So I don't even remember what it looks like. I just remember having that reaction to it. Thank you. That's an interesting question. Does anybody want to ask any questions about the talk before? Because I have a lot to say about that one. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> I actually, I, I really enjoyed the talk. There, there, I was kind of getting focused on coming up and talking about my talk. So there were two points that came up. Uh, so the, the pyramid, and you, when you've got the upside down pyramid, so one thing that a lot of us do is conflate tools with function. And so just because something's in Cucumber, if that's the tool that you're using on your project, doesn't mean it has to be an end-to-end -end test. So imagine a case where you've got something that emits a bunch of uh, user-friendly messages under different error conditions, and your stakeholders really care that those messages are expressed the way they want them to be expressed. Well, you don't want to necessarily have to create the whole world in order to be able to test 50 different messages and create it 50 times over and over again. It's perfectly okay 
to use Cucumber to just go right after the object. You're not specifying that in this feature. You're saying, hey, when this happens, it's very declarative, then I expect this message. When this happens, I expect this message. So just be careful about that distinction. Um, and the other thing, which you know, I really shouldn't even start because we'll be here for a long time, uh, was the question about mock objects. Um, I'm just going to say this. Uh, there is a lot of confusion about the terminology about mock objects, and I am here to make it even more confusing for you. Um, so uh, the, the idea has been around for since like 2002, 2003, and it's evolved in a lot of different ways. The way we use it in Ruby, because it's a dynamic language and because we could go in and we can change classes at runtime, um, has changed the way I think about them a little bit. So we talk about mock objects and we talk about stubs. But really, or not really, the way I think about it is we've got substitute objects or test doubles, and we've got real objects in the system. When you talk about a mock, which some people here will agree with this definition and some will disagree, uh, is a, an object that you can interrogate. Oh, am I out of time? So it's, the idea is you tell it what to expect, and then it tells you at the end whether it, all the expectations were met. So you don't have to go in and check its state to see that stuff happened that you want to happen. So uh, that was sort of the idea of mock objects that evolved like, uh, I don't know, 2004, 2005. Um, so the important thing, though, is, is at, the in, is at the method level, right? That you can say, I expect this particular method to be called, perhaps with these arguments, and if you're, I mean, a big thing is that mocks and they're, are really well suited for systems that are designed following the tell, don't ask principle. So you, I, ideally, you don't even need to set a return value, but uh, we do set a return value, which is sort of functioning like a stub value, like a canned value, just to be able to make things work. Um, and if you say, I want to stub a method, uh, you're saying, I want to stub a method, they could be on the same object. So we, we set message expectations and we set canned values on real objects and we set them on fake objects. So I just think of the term uh, mock objects to be really confusing at this point because, yeah, I don't know. Did that help? <laughs> All right, I think I'm done. Thank you very much.